But thank you everybody for uh, for signing in and you know being a part of this session. Um, I just think it's amazing that the diversity committee have got to the stage where we can invite really important guests in to talk about their work and offer us inspiration as to how we can go ahead with our work. Um, so Diana Haskell, huge thank you um, for um, offering to come along with Harvey Lockhart today and um, to talk about um, the work that you both do with Heal Centre for the Arts, which I'll pop in the chat so everyone can see the website website. I'm going to um, hand straight over to you both because I'm sure that you'll, you'll tell us all much better than me um, what, what you do and, and why it's so important you're here with us today. But welcome to the both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Harvey, do you want to start? And... Sure. Sure. I guess I'll um, share my screen here. Where did it go? One second. Okay, there we go. Oh, I got it there. All right, try one more time. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, thank you again. To everyone, I hope you guys can see this presentation okay. Um, but thank you again for having us. My name is Harvey Lockhart. I am the director and founder um, of Heal Center for the Arts. I also serve as its executive and artistic director. So we are a young, very small nonprofit organization um, who are priding ourselves on making quality arts programming accessible to all students, especially those of urban communities. So we want to get started, just kind of um, go over a few things about our organization, who we are and what we do. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about um, who I am and why I started Heal Center for the Arts uh, back in 2015. So we will move forward with... Okay. Here's our mission, or here's our presentation agenda, things that we're going to cover um, during this presentation today. So this is who we are. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, and eventually we will be a multidisciplinary arts center. Uh, we are right now in St. Louis, Missouri, and in Missouri, um, the arts programs have been dwindling in the urban communities uh, for several years now. And uh, when I arrived to um, St. Louis back in 2010, after completing my master's degree at Northern Illinois University, I noticed that um, you know the arts were really dwindling. Um, the school that I was hired to teach at, Riverview Gardens High School, did not have a full band at all. As, as a matter of fact, when I got there, there was like 10 students in the band and they were all um, in the drum line and maybe two or three of them were horn players. And you know they they were doing the best they could with what they had. Um, so I came in, and my standard was a little bit higher. You know, I'm getting out of graduate school, and I'm so excited to teach. And you know, I'm, well, you guys gotta learn this. You have to do this and that. And they're looking at me. Well, I don't want to play none. Of, I don't want to play scales. I, I want to play the, the the music that's on the radio. And I said, well, I want you to play the music that's on the radio too, but I want you to play it better than what you're playing it now. So we had a we had a little back and forth argument with that, but um, fast forward a few years, I developed some programs, and you know I'm one of those people that I don't wait around for people to do things for my students. You know I um, I ask for help, and if I get help, great. If I don't get help, great. I'm gonna um, initiate the change that I want to see in in our communities, and. Um, so this is a little bit about who we are. Um, and you can read more about that. Um, and we'll share this with everybody. Again, our mission is to make quality arts programming accessible to all students, especially those in urban communities. The accessibility piece is important because like I was beginning to tell you, our students in St. Louis particularly did not have access to private lessons. They didn't have access to um, a full band program. 
As a matter of fact, for nine years while I was teaching at this particular school, I was starting students in high school from scratch every single year. I was building a program from scratch every single year. And we also had a highly transient population, which means our students lived in high poverty um, and they were, they were moving in and out of the district um, on a yearly basis, sometimes monthly. And um, it, it was very challenging, um, but I did everything I could to reach as many students as possible and really um, give them access to something of quality programming. So it took uh, several years, but um, Human Center for the Arts was born out of that. So before I um, get into our programs, um, well, I'll just go ahead and share with you now. Uh, we have four programs that are our core we have jazz ensemble, um, in which um, it was started back in 2010, and then eventually um, came under the umbrella of Heal Center for the Arts. But since 2011, um, this ensemble has been recruited, uh, well requested to perform at over 50 shows, uh, both public and private events uh, per year, 50 performances per year um, since 2011. So we estimate that on a yearly basis, you know, um, those students play for about 25,000 people per year. So, and it's a blessing. Um, and we are, we're very excited and happy about those students. And then you'll learn about a little bit more about the success behind um, the result of that program. As you can imagine, um, that with uh, when they graduate high school, they have over 200 performances under their belt, just how much it does to their enthusiasm, their uh, self-esteem, all of those things are really, you know, help um, toward the, the success of that program. We also have an intellectual artist series um, in which we are trying, well, we teach students how to um, I, um, appreciate the history and the culture behind the, the arts discipline that they're studying. So we read books, nonfiction articles, anything that's dealing with um, understanding the history um, and going beyond the surface, because uh, we believe that we want our students to be able to create meaningful art. And the only way you do that is you have to uh, be informed. You have to be well informed. So we teach them about the history. Right now we're reading, um, moving, what's the name? Duke Ellington's America uh, by Harry, Harvey G. Cohen. It's a very thick book, um, but we're reading it. And um, our very first book in the series, we read uh, Wynton Marcellus's book, Moving to Higher Ground. We had 60 students a part of that program that we're reading and um, you know the students of urban communities a lot of times we, they don't have access uh, to books um, and a lot of them myself included we were not um, nobody pressed the issue of the importance of reading studying the history it wasn't until I wanted to learn more that you know I, I realized hey I have to go and I have to read you know, so with our students, I, I really push that because it's extremely important to their development. You know, we read about um, all about we read about the, the um, artists' lives. We read about their business practices. All of these things are important, especially with regard to developing young artists. We want them to know not just how to, um, you know, that, that you have to be more than just a talented musician. You know, you have to be able to sustain your art as well. So you have to be able to support yourself. And the way you do that is by understanding about business and money. So those are some things that we're working on with our students. Um, we also are developing a private lesson program, private and group lesson program for both instrumental and vocal musicians. Um, we partner with uh, local symphony musicians or other highly skilled musicians and educators from throughout the city. And they, um, they work with some of our students to uh, give them in the form of a private lesson or group lesson format and, and it's free to the students or at a very low price. Um, and lastly, we have a, um, a summer jazz camp. We have two versions of this camp. Uh, we have one um, that is a live version in which our students that are in the point of view jazz ensemble, you know, we do a couple weeks um, where they have an intensive program that prepares them for the rigorous uh, performance year that they're about to go through. And um, it also prepares those outgoing seniors 
uh, to be highly competitive for um, the professional market. So uh, we do a lot with that program and um, that's the, our time to really just dive in and get together. And I didn't mention that these students are from multiple schools throughout the city. And lastly, well, I won't say lastly, but uh, this is our history. So why was Hill formed? Well, I'll tell you, um, I grew up in Miami, Florida. Um, and throughout my life, you know, I was exposed to the arts. I, fortunately, I was probably one, the last generation that had the opportunity to go through a fully functional arts programming from elementary, middle to high school and high school. And um, at, so when I was in elementary school, I had the privilege and honor to be able to perform regularly with the, the program that I was a part of. And we, we even performed in the Bahamas and Jamaica when I was in elementary school. And most of my students can't even comprehend that. Um, but we, we were able to do that. So, I, and after I graduated high school, programs started to dwindle across the country, budget cuts, all of those things. So I was 15 years old and I felt that, you know, God had given me a vision um, that one day I would um, create a program similar to the one that I was attending every day for my formative, formative years. So that place that I was attending every day after school was the African Heritage Cultural Arts Center in the heart of Liberty City, Florida, Miami. And um, it still exists today. It's about 45 years old. And that center changed my life, changed my life. We have, um, I was trained in music, art, dance, theater, photography, all of the arts, every area. And it really shaped my perception um, and really helped me to think and um, create art on a different level. You know, from, I, I don't even know the, the, the appropriate word to describe it, but I create not just from a, a musical point of view. So, um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But that place really shaped me and it shaped so many other students. And um, I, I believe when from 15, I believe that one day I would create something. And then here it is in 2015, I, um, I, I had the opportunity. So Hill Center for the Arts was um, developed here in St. Louis because there was such a need for it. After I had moved out of Miami and moved, went to college and graduate school and saw a need. So you can learn a little bit more about that as well. Um, so here's our accomplishments so far. You know, Hill Center for the Arts graduates 100% of our students from high school and attend college. Now, you, you might say, well, that's nothing significant. Well, for the students that we reach, it is very significant um, because a lot of them, a lot of the students that I had to work with really struggle. They go through a lot, um, but I'm so happy and grateful that I get a chance to give them an alternative to some of the things that are going on in the neighborhoods, um, that I get a chance to step in to prevent some of those things that could happen to them that are happening to those their peers like teenage pregnancy and not just affecting the women the young ladies but also the young men who when they when they do um go go down that road they have to provide for the child so they're not able to um really uh, pursue their their dreams or their potential as a result of some of those uh, bad choices that they've made i, I was to say or unfortunate choices but in spite of all of that, our students, we graduate 100% of our students go to college. 100% um, of our students earn full scholarships to college. Now they may not choose the option that gives them the full scholarship all the time, but they, um, needless to say, if they, they needed to, they could. They have a full ride somewhere that they qualify for. Um, Several of our students um, have gone on to um, qualify to attend music conservatories and uh, some of the big uh, named universities. And then uh, this coming fall, we have three students that have been accepted already to attend the Berkeley School of Music um, that will be attending this fall. Um, so 
I'm not going to go into this right now. These are some things that I want you to look at and I'm kind of moving fast so that we can have some dialogue um, and I can answer some questions. Um, but with, with regard to um, diversity and everything, my, my views about music um, have never been through the lens of color. Um, my uh, perception has always been about the spiritual journey that I'm taking on when I perform, uh, when I compose music, when I listen to music. You know, it's always been an honest reflection of the emotions, the human emotions and experiences um, that come from the music that people create. So I don't know how and why diversity is such a big issue in music. Um, it, to me, I think people make such a big deal of something that should be our only place, not only place, but one of the places that we can go to where we can just be because music just is. It has no color. It has no, it's so objective. You describe it how you want to. And I love that about music. And when we're talking about how we reach people, you close your eyes and music is just going to touch you in some way. It doesn't, you don't, you don't know who created it. You don't know the color of their skin. You don't know their cultural background. You just know that, Hey, this thing is touching you. And that's the beauty behind music. My life has been that way. You know, growing up, I was, it was always instilled to me to have great pride in yourself, great character, great musicianship, you know, have a strong self image. Those things were instilled into me. I didn't know why. I didn't know why when I was in elementary school and middle school, I'm all, all I'm hearing is, you are somebody. I'm like, duh, why you keep telling me that? Why am I hearing this all the time? I am somebody. It's being preached to me everywhere I go. And I went to predominantly black schools in the urban communities growing up. And this is all I'm hearing. I didn't realize they were planting seeds, planting seeds in me that were gonna strengthen me when I stepped outside of those communities, when I went into the real world, because I would need the fruit from those seeds one day. Um, people like one of my mentors, Corey Ritherspoon, um, he instilled into me, be an individual, be an individual, stand out, don't fit in. You know, messages like that from my teachers in high school, uh, my, my high school band director who is doing an amazing job now with his programs, uh, Christopher Dorsey, his, um, his mentality was sink or swim. He's going to give you an opportunity, but if you don't prepare yourself, you're going to sink. You're going to, you know, you want to do this? Okay, here's a platform. I'm going to put you on stage. Now, if you mess it up, that's on you. I learned so much from those experiences. And I kind of do that with my students today. You know, we prepare you and then we put you out there and let you do the rest. Um, and then going to college, to uh, HBCU, Historically Black College and University, Florida A&M University. And where, you know, having pride and integrity in your profession, one of my professors, Dr. Shelby Chipman, you know, we had to, we had to dress up at every recital, you know, and, I, and I, as I work with other universities and other students, um, when they go and hear um, the students do their juries, you know, students could come as you are, you can wear your flip flops, you can do all of those things. We couldn't do that. We had to come dressed, a suit, shirt and tie at every one of those concerts or uh, student recitals when we were performing and both when we were sitting in the audience. We, it was just an integrity thing. It was a pride thing. It, and it's still so much into me about, again, building on that, standing out, not fitting in, knowing that you are somebody, knowing that you are not what they say you are, whoever they are, saying negative things about you and your culture. You are not that. So being trained to um, value what you are and the things that you're learning and what was so important. And as an educator, one of my um, mentors, Melton Mustafa, Melton Mustafa Jr. I saw him, I saw him teach 
in such a way, it showed me that students are capable of doing anything, anything. The limitation comes from us, from me. When I'm teaching my students, the only reason why they can't learn something is because of me. But when I remove those limitations and I teach them without limitation, without fear, without, um, you know, I teach them through my insecurities, through my inabilities, my students soar. They, they can do anything. I just have to lead them to where they need to go. I saw those things and it shaped who I am. My, my, uh, my cousin and my, my other mentor, Melton Mustafa Sr., they show me what I can be, being a professional musician, going out there in the real world. Melton Mustafa played with the Count Basie Orchestra and he started me off playing saxophone. You know, I, my first scale was a blues scale. I didn't know what a major scale was. You know, it's just different perceptions that kind of shaped who I am, you know? So I, I'm, I'm really passionate about, you know, teaching urban students or just students period. Um, but I think a lot of people are afraid to teach um, urban students, whatever that means, because we label, relate like even that term urban is, you know, some people say at risk, you know, I, I just hate labeling, but we're teaching music, we're sharing, we're sharing what we all love. And to me, when we remove those boundaries and those limitations, the sky's the limit to what we can do. You know, it's, it, it really is, you know, and, and now I teach just to the glory of God, because that's, I couldn't, I can't do anything without, without God in my life. Uh, so those, this is my story. This is the things that I do. Um, and, and these are the reasons why I have such a high level of respect for the students that I work with. And also why I've achieved the success that I have um, with my students, you know, and, and I don't take any of the glory to myself. The proof is in the pudding with the students. When you see them, you know, you, you, you just know, you just know that they're, they're one of my students and you can expect certain things when you, you know, meet one of my students. Um, but I don't wanna just keep talking. I'd rather us have a dialogue. So if we could, I mean, I'm not sure what the protocol is. Um, maybe we can have some conversations, especially over how um, myself or Diana can work with the ICA over some of the things listed here on the uh, screen, or we can have a conversation about whatever you want. Um, how do I teach different students, whatever. Um, I just wanna hear from you and uh, Thank you again for being allowing us to be here. If I can just step in here for a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, to thank Harvey. I think everybody who's here can see what a, a motivational, um, inspiring uh, man he is, uh, who he really is an amazing teacher uh, to his students. He's tough on them, but they love him because they know he has their back. Um, and he uh, has many students that uh, are, are doing incredibly well um, and in every way. Uh, and so I just, I wanted to talk a little bit just for a couple minutes about how I got involved um, because as an orchestral musician, musician of course, uh, we go to schools in every city that I've ever been a part of an orchestra. Um, and even in college, I went to many, many schools and, um, you know, you see some schools that have these sort of advanced programs and, you know, sort of nice, you know, band rooms and orchestra rooms and other schools just, just don't have that. And it always bothered me, um, but I didn't really know what to do about that at all. Uh, and, you know, we lead busy lives in the orchestra and all that. So I did my usual teaching and um, did what I could. Uh, one sort of turning point for me was, um, probably 10 years ago, I went to East St. Louis, which if any of you are familiar with East St. Louis, it's um, a pretty uh, poverty place with a lot of poverty, a lot of crime, uh, and a lot of people who are really trying to make a difference with very, very little. I went to the middle school uh, first time and uh, talked to the clarinet and saxophone students and asked them how many reads uh, they, they, got, they had and how many they used. And they said, oh, one. And I said, oh, that's great. Sometimes you might need to use two a week. 
And the band director tapped me on the shoulder and he said, they get one read a semester. And I, I just remember the, it, the, I just was humbled beyond belief, horrified that I had said this uh, with a total lack of understanding for what was going on. And it was at that point, I started going back to that middle school, Lincoln Middle School. I went there quite regularly for quite some time uh, and until the band director retired and, and then I um, kind of moved on to some other things. Um, but what I saw at the school, hunger to learn, um, kids that were joyful and just uh, interested in, in learning how to play. And I started to think, you know, is there a way that I can be more involved on a regular basis for students that really want lessons? Uh, can I do that? And I kept thinking about it and didn't do anything about it. And then two of Harvey's students uh, wrote to the symphony and said they'd like to take lessons. And at that point, I was, I was overwhelmed with work. Uh, I connected with these two young women, uh, Kaylin and Cassandra, and said, I'm very sorry, I can't teach right now. Um, I can give you one lesson right now. And then they kept writing. They were persistent, probably because Harvey was asking them to me. And eventually, I had some room in my schedule to be able to drive to Riverview Gardens and teach Kaylin and Cassandra and Heaven, and then uh, on occasion, another young woman named Gone. And what struck me when I walked into the school, I didn't know about Heal at all, was wow, Harvey is doing an amazing, amazing job with these students. He's a really great teacher, but also wow, the conditions were not so, so superb, but he made do, and he was always positive about it, said don't focus on that. The first few weeks with these uh, young women, I, I uh, was crammed in a very small space, uh, literally. And I, they said to me after about the third week, Mrs. Haskell, why are you here? Why are you bothering to teach us? And I said, you know, three miles down the road this way, there is a school that has an entire wing of the high school devoted to a uh, band and orchestra. And there's another school, another direction that has a bank of individual practice rooms in, in their band wing. And I said, and here we are, I'm teaching you and working with you in a closet. There's something not right about this. And I want to, if you want to learn how to play an instrument, you want to learn how to play clarinet, I'm here for you, I'm not gonna give up. We're gonna just do this. And you know, um, we just uh, really had a good time. We did a lot of group lessons. Um, it was almost like a one room schoolhouse. We would meet, I would work, uh, with them all on one topic and then each person individually and the others would sit there and for the most part listen pretty well um, and all all of those young women um, have gone on to college uh, and not uh, one is a music major uh, music ed major one was but has uh, gone a different direction uh, I don't know what Goni's um, major is at Washington University um, and Heaven is, went to a kind of, did she go to like a technical school? Uh, but anyway, she's now in, in the medical field. Uh, and so they've done extremely well and they are lovely women, such a, just such a joy to work with. In the middle of all this, uh, Harvey started talking to me about HEAL and I thought, this is really cool. So the students that I taught became part of that. And I'm also on the board now we're small, but we're mighty, and we have big ideas, not just for jazz, but for um, all of the arts. Next steps will be, hopefully, to uh, get the lesson component really solid and up and running. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking to you a little bit now, is uh, are a few ideas that we thought we might, um, might be beneficial to ICA and us, the ways that we could partner, but there might be other ideas as well. I don't know if people want to talk about that or if you have questions for us uh, before we go into that. I don't know. What do you think, Sarah, Denise? Um, I think we can throw it um, to questions. And if there's no questions at this stage, then please carry on. Um, and we can talk about how, you know, organizations such as HEAL can collaborate more with organizations such as ICA. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, please 
come on to um onto the microphone if you do. Don't be shy, everybody. Feel free to, <laughs> to ask questions. I'll ask. Um, in addition to um, just just um, man hours as far as like teaching, are there other resources like sheet music or um, you know accessories and whatnot that can be donated and sent over to you? Because um, I'm sure that many people probably have boxes of reeds that are no longer the right size or you know something you know some extra copies of sheet music that they have laying around that they no longer need that might be appropriate so um i for one definitely have some sheet music books that i'd be happy to send over there yes um yes um that we, we would take those things yes we um a lot of our students like i said before they don't have the opportunity to play in um, a full ensemble they don't have their schools don't have full instrumentation so it'd be very helpful that we can get um various selections that are like quartets, trios, duos, those things that um, you know, of various different levels to um, at least they get an opportunity to play in some type of ensemble. And we have the ability to um, allow them to perform that mm -hmm. as possible. So Harvey, I have a question for you. Diana knows um, this is a, a passion of mine. Um, is there a way you can think of to help us as college teachers, uh, when we're hearing auditions, listening for potential rather than accomplishments pre-college. I mean, I think I think like uh, you know letters and things from from music teachers. Hey, you need to listen to this kid because while he they sound rough on the outside they've got a passion for this i mean this is an issue that is near and dear to my heart that we do not expect as college teachers putting a socioeconomic barrier on students that they have had five years of private lessons prior to auditioning for a college music program yeah i really appreciate that question um you know just growing up in miami i've had the privilege of seeing some amazingly talented students, but there's always some barrier that uh, prevents us from moving to the next level or even from working with uh, some of the best teachers. All right, so a lot of the time, you know, like we can't afford private lessons. Our students couldn't afford private lessons. They couldn't afford to work with um, the right teachers, um, but, but they can play. They can really play and they really want to play. They really have a strong desire. Some of them, don't have the, they can't afford the, the, the equipment um, in order, the, the, the schools don't have the resources, the band directors do the best they can. So they do things like what I did with Diana, reach out to her and ask if she'll be willing to help, ask if she'll be willing to teach her students. Now I had some resources. I gave all of my students, uh, my clar the young clarinet players, um, mouthpieces. I made sure that they can play their scales two octaves. I made sure that they came to her, you know, they were ready for her somewhat, you know, they, like they weren't just beginners. But I can, I can, I know for sure now there are several students um, that I can point in your direction now that, um, that have been trained. They're, they're at schools that have win ensembles, that they're really playing at high, very challenging literature. Um, and these students can read, but they don't, again, they don't have the resources. They don't have a lot. Another barrier is the students don't have test prep resources in order to help them to pass the ACT or SAT um, at a high enough score to where the university would, would admit them. So there's so many, so many things that stand in their way from even moving forward. Yeah. In California, we're getting kind of uh we did away with the sat three years ago there are no test tests required however as we become and my my university of our system is impacted and so as we become impacted um what ends up happening for us is that they raise the grade point average for high school, which is not a reflection on potential. It is a reflection on past work, but they raise, and it has no relevance to music. So they raise the grade point average. And what we notice, we're the most diverse university in the nation. What we notice is suddenly 
are that particular major where we've put um, impaction criteria down suddenly becomes less diverse. Yeah. 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 I know, you know, Julie and I have talked about this, that, you know, there, there are so many issues around this. I think you're right, Julia, that you, that the idea that teachers need to understand if they have a student that with talent, they need to put that in their recommendation letters. And, and, and so that it becomes less about the teacher's ego and how many great students they have but actually thinking about the student first and, and um, you know, pointing them to schools like yours, where I know that a student is going to get a good education with understanding. Um, and I think, you know, that is a huge issue it, <laughs> to overcome is, uh, you know, what the focus is. Is it on the, the teacher or is it on the student? Um, and I think, you know, there are other issues as well. I think a big issue is um, finding teachers that are willing to go to schools. Uh, Transportation is always an issue. So if there are teachers willing to work with uh, grade school, middle school, high school uh, students and are willing to go, or right now we can do it by via Zoom, they're willing to take the time to work with students that ordinarily don't uh, uh, have a lot of opportunities, but really want to play, then that's another issue that I think that we can uh, address long term. This sort of a long term thing is just sort of changing the perception of like, well, I've got the studio and here's my rate and good luck if you can't do it. Too bad. You know, we have to be able to learn to be somewhat flexible. I would say, um, in addition to that, um, Julia, does your school offer graduate programs? Yeah, well, a master's program, but no doctoral program. Well, that's great. Um, I can point you, I can uh, connect you with a, a few HBCUs, um, historically black colleges, universities that have stellar um, young clarinetists mm -hmm. in their programs who graduate with education degrees um, and who would love to um, move on and further their education. But again, um, I think having a relationship with those young students early would mm -hmm. give them something to look forward to give them something to work toward. I, I found with working with my students, a lot of times motivation is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. uh, when they don't have anything to look forward to, they just, they just do that. Well, you know? right, I totally agree. And I have, okay, because I like to hear potential with people and I, and I am a person who went to college to major in music without any private lessons. And I know what a struggle that was. Um, but what I and honestly, when we get students and luckily my colleague in the my colleagues in the band and orchestra area, I mean, they always will look to me, okay, what do you think? And I'm like, hey, let's take them. And honestly, I don't really if music is what got them to college and then they changed majors, fabulous. Music is what actually was the catalyst to get them to go to college. And in California, that's a game changer for people's income for their life. If we can get them through college, that is just, it's a huge, and I mean, the majority of my students, like the majority of students at our university, our first gen students. So anything we can do that would allow students to know that there are places that are looking for potential and passion and not previous accomplishments. I would love to work with you. I have several teachers that I can um, send your way and um, establish a partnership with you. And, Fantastic. Uh, you'll enjoy those students. They can play. I would love that. <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. Um, do you want to talk about ways we have come up to with to maybe partner? Sure, let me get that presentation. I'm on mute. Can I just um, raise um, something I just popped in the chat and um, that just from the conversation with Julia, it just kind of really highlighted to me how wrong the conservatoire system is, certainly in the UK, where the scholarships go to the best players or the people who play the rare instrument. I think very, um, it just doesn't happen where 
a scholarship will go to somebody who needs the money. Um, and Spence has just um, as well put, well, that's the case in the USA as well. Um, I think this is something that really needs to be shouted about. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a tricky, yeah, it's kind of a tricky conversation, really, you know, because you definitely want to reward the student that is that has been preparing their whole life for this moment and has been prepared. You definitely want to reward those students, but you also want to um, you want to give the others the opportunity, not necessarily lowering the standard, um, but still giving them the opportunity. That means being intentional about making yourself aware or um, accessible to those students. Um, making those students aware of your existence. Like there's so many schools out there who only market themselves to that student that has been taking those private lessons and they, they're not willing to go and find the needle in the haystack or, you know, the gym that, you know, that needs to be, um, what's the word? I can't find a word, but you, you know what I'm saying? The, the gym that has been hidden right now that you have to dig and kind of, you know, but if they're there. They're, they're everywhere, but I think we just have to be <coughs> intentional about going out to get those students. Because we, you do find those students who can really play, but they're not trying to major in music. They just, they can just play. Their parents, you know, did, did their job with providing them the structure and, you know, and, and the resources in order to be able to play at the level that they do, but they have no desire to um, be musicians. On the other hand, you have young kids, young students who really want to do this, but they haven't been adequately prepared. So how do we juggle that? Yeah. So so we looked at a few ways that we can help. Um, and one of my favorites is um, the last one is um, introducing ICA to school programs that have strong clarinet students of color, um, high schools and universities. I think um, this is a low hanging fruit. Um, this will be easy. Um, and I have resources right now um, throughout the country that I can um, share and uh, directors that I can point, point you and get you in contact with um, throughout the country. Um, unfortunately, St. Louis, we're really trying to develop our young students. So uh, middle and high school students in urban areas you know, those programs just don't exist right now, but we're working to rebuild that so that they can be a part of the conversation as well. But there is a way that the ICA could help um, those young schools as well. And I think it's gonna be in term of, uh, in the form of resources, as far as reads, the, the, the trios, duos, duets, and uh, quartets, things like that. Um, for those younger programs in St. Louis. But um, everything else that's listed here are great ways um, that the ICA can partner with us and other institutions that are doing similar work. Harvey, I love this list. I love, um, these are some things that I was hoping that you all would come up with because this is what I would like for us is that we are able to do some concrete things that can start making a difference we don't want to just talk about it. So we appreciate you coming to discuss this with us. And you're giving us some things that now here we have a list of go get to work on this and go do this. And any ideas that you have for us that we can help. You know, some of the things we've talked about are reaching out to music educators, education associations to try to get out and, and send ICA members out into schools to do clinics and things like that. Um, but I think we need to target more where that we go rather than just going to these schools who already have everything that they need. We need to help those students who need us. That's, I think, where the most important work can be done. And I appreciate, you know, any, please give us your honesty and your real ideas. This, this is what we want to do. And we'd love yeah. to partner with you. I think, you know, you know, Diana and I were having these conversations um, for several months now. She said, Harvey, I don't know if uh, people would do this or do that, but you know, the one thing I've been telling her, fundamentals, fundamentals. Our yeah. students are not being, well, at least Clint, young clarinet is, they, like, it's, I'm a woodwind specialist. So, you know, I double on clarinet and flute. You know, I would never call myself a professional on those, even though I get paid to play them sometimes. Um, 
but um, just because of my jazz background, I have to double. So, but I, it's things that I had to really learn about the instrument, you know, in order to really uh, be able to play. You know, you have to learn the registers of the clarinet. The clarinet, some people call it the black stick of death. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, why, why is it that everybody is afraid to cross the break? You know, what? why? And, and this is stuff that band directors come up with. I've seen young band directors will have the student play a scale up to A and then go down the octave to play B and C. I said, why do you do that? You know, so it's just, so in other words, I think education to, to the band directors would be helpful, you know? Absolutely, I agree. You know, we've, Harvey has talked to, uh, and I agree, I just haven't had time uh, or sort of resources to know how to start, but we think it would be great on, um, on Heal's website or a secondary website to have, tips and tricks for every instrument. Um, we could start with clarinet and people could just say, you know, here are some tips to get over the break. Here's some tips for helping with Abisher. You know, just some things to help band directors um, uh, get started. And all of us know in the clarinet industry who those people are that already have some of that information online, but to actually have it uh, in one area for each instrument would be fantastic. It could really grow, um, which kind of speaks to one of our needs. We're so small, we don't have a staff. Um, you know, if one, one idea might be if there is a very organized, enthusiastic um, person who's working on a master's or a doctoral degree, maybe they'd like to intern and work on a project or two um, with, with Harvey. Uh, and so, I mean, there are a lot of projects that we'd like to do. Uh, we just don't have the funding or the manpower or person power. So, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, kind of a list. Um, one, one thing I feel like might be helpful is to do a webinar uh, where we talk, um, you know, Harvey impressed upon me the importance of um, being somebody that's not going to fly in and do a class or two and then leave, but to actually stick it out week by week by week with students so they know you're there for them. Um, that's very important. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, ideas that Harvey and I have that could really help people who are interested in uh, teaching in urban areas. Uh, one thing I just want to make clear is None of us believe that we're important in of our, our own selves. Students don't need us. They don't need lessons. But if they want them, then that becomes a need. And then I want to be there, and I know a lot of people do as well, to teach them. Um, so there's a distinction there. I always say if students want lessons, um, I think we need to make an effort to, to find a way for them. I agree 100%. You know, I always tell my students, you know, to whom much is given, much is required, and the requirements come first. So if you want private lessons, I'm not going to allow you to waste anybody's time, nor my time. So I don't pass any students on to um, any teachers unless they are lesson ready. Yeah, and, and committed to and committed to it. Right. So um, I, yeah. I, I've met with a lot of directors. Um, who are just clueless and sometimes don't have the time to really um, study the instruments, you know, like, you know, and some, to, to be honest, some of them don't even play their, their primary instruments well, unfortunately. And I'm not trying to disrespect any band director that doesn't play your primary instrument well. Not all the way, I'm not trying to disrespect you all the way, just a little bit. But, um, you know, students see that. You know, so how, how can you tell me something and then you, you can't do it yourself? So the, the faith in the students and the director sometimes doesn't, you know, it doesn't line up. The students are just, they just, they're there to get a grade, unfortunately, on some, some situations. But there are those directors who say, hey, I have a lot on my plate. Yes, I can play my instrument well, but I don't know enough about this one. So I'm making sure that they have a, um, 
a certain level of their fundamentals down and now they're ready because I can't show them anything beyond this. Now they're ready to study with a teacher. So I think having those conversations, maybe some webinars that we go in intentionally with a particular school and say, hey, we want to offer this for you um, and then just give it to them and, and help them to work with their students and, and bring their students up to par and then we take another school and do the same thing. Can I jump in and just say one? I've had a lot of students um, and I, I am very careful to teach my own students this now who start teaching, but I've had a lot of students who've come from programs uh, and I do not want them to suffer from this with, you know, me sending them away after that first week and they come back and they haven't practiced well it's because no one showed them how to practice and no yeah. one showed them exactly what they need to do okay i i can't judge that student i also can't judge that band director because you know they're one band director in a school in california of five thousand students and they're running marching band year round so this is so if if we can find a way that it's not only that, hey, here's your assignment, go ahead and do it. If we can find a way that, hey, we actually have to teach students um, at all levels, this is how you actually do this. I only see you for one hour a week, but let me write down a very intricate plan for what you're gonna do every day, which takes a, a big amount of time and then to say, if you have questions about this, please contact me. Don't wait until next week. You know, and so I get students who, it, you know, when they're freshmen and they come in, they'll text me or email me four or five times a week. Fantastic. I love that. You know, but I do know that there's the opposite side of that, that there's some colleagues of mine who will say, well, they should just know how to do this. That's the attitude I would love to shift. You know, I mean, because we see it in academics at, at a university level too. P students come to campus and no one showed them how to study. Yeah, I, I, um, I believe that that, sh that, should, that should definitely be a balanced approach to that. Um, when I, when I, with my students, I do not baby them. I do not baby them and I'm very upfront with them. And I tell them from day one, if you wanna be here, you're gonna be in this program, you're gonna get a lot of opportunities. But if you don't value the opportunity, I'm gonna give it to somebody else. I tell them that day one, I'm not, I'm not gonna baby you. I'm not going to do that. So if you wanna be here, do what it takes. This is what it takes to stay here. And I'm gonna give you some grace I'm gonna give you some grace. I'm gonna hold your hand just a little bit at the beginning. And if you drop the ball, that's it. It's I'm you know I come from a big city too, you know. California is, is huge, you know. Miami, it's huge. It's so many people that I, I knew that if I didn't uh, practice, this 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 young and behind me, this young person behind me, they're gonna try to take my seat. And I didn't want to give my seat up. I love being in that first chair, right? So I try to teach that to my students here in the smaller city in St. Louis, Missouri, that look, you can't, you can't do that. The real world doesn't work that way. I'm not going to baby you. I'm going to prepare you. But if you don't value the opportunity, the real world, you're going to, in the real world, you're going to lose it. So it's coaching through the process. Yeah, I mean, I have a few other programs, but sometimes in rehearsal, I'm just, they're just getting tough love, the whole rehearsal. There's no playing going on. I'm instilling them those same things that are instilled to me. You are somebody, you are this, you are that. You, you are dropping the ball. You're embarrassing me, yourself and your family by doing what you're doing. Sometimes they need that behind the door, but that's tough love. It's love, right? But when they, and sometimes love is loving you enough to let you go, right? Sometimes I've had to experience that, but I understand that there needs to be a balanced approach to that. You have to love through the process. You have to give them the tough love. You have to be gentle, 
through the through the process. And especially if you have a colleague that is, um, um, you know, that 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 is the good cop, and the other person is a bad cop. I think the balance is beautiful because they kind of need a little bit of both. Um, because, like you said, you have to train them, you know. But I also believe that. Um, and sometimes only I can tell my students this because sometimes they won't receive it from other people, right? But sometimes I tell them, I tell them from my experiences, it's no excuse. You know, one of my favorite quotes, this might be a, a, a Harveyism. Um, it's my fault that I don't know. It's my fault that I don't know. I, ju I just want to, I mean, I just want to piggyback on this a little bit. And, and uh, one day I was in Harvey's band room and somebody had their head on the music stand and harvey said what are you doing that's a music stand it's not a sleeping stand and the person went i'm sorry i'm sorry and then harvey said you know i love you right <laughs> and all the whole class went yes lockhart we know and i think that you do have that really wonderful ability to uh, have very high standards but still show them you know love and it's what we all need to do um, in our own ways. Yeah, I like the conversations that are happening in the chat, you know, about um, developing a video series. Um, there's a, a pedagogy committee um, working on educational videos. That's beautiful. Um, especially in the time that we're in now, you know, students can go in and, and, and work, students and directors can go in and um, view those videos at their own pace. Um, my only question is, how accessible are they? Um, is there membership requirements? Um, or, I mean, how, how do these directors know, get a chance to know that the, um, these resources exist? I think that the ICA's overall goal moving forward, and Denise, correct me if I'm wrong here, but is that content that is gated is not beneficial to anyone, and a membership in the ICA should be someone who is motivated to participate in the community that we've created and um, we want to create resources that are valuable to anyone and have that be our legacy rather than just say you know we made all these really great resources but you have to be a member and so many people are restricted and can't pay the the membership fee even right now we have a ten dollar student membership which is a really great deal but that's too much for somebody sometimes so i think all of the content that we have, aside from maybe the current issue of the journal, would not be paywalled. So any of these new videos would be up on YouTube and we would just compile the links directly on the front end of the website. Um, I know that Clarinet Fest this summer has been moved virtual, but it's going to be a four week festival rather than a single week or a four day period. And we're going to stretch it over the course of four weekends in July. And it's 100% free, member or not. And this, this, this situation being what it is, is not great because we can't meet in person, but it actually allows us to do something completely different and try to build a community strong around these types of um, issues. And I'm, I'm really proud of the work that this committee and all of the other committees that we formed in the fall, um, looking at the needs that we had and saying, we have a, we have a duty as, as the International Clarinet Association to represent and provide resources for all clarinetists, regardless of ability level or interest level. You know, some people don't want to be a professional musician. They just want to play. They just want to enjoy that. And some people come to the clarinet when they're 80, <laughs> hmm. you know? So we have, to, we have to embrace all of them as this organization. And I think this committee has done really great work. I know that the new music committee is working very hard. The youth committee just had a lecture yesterday for band directors, actually, and we recorded that session. We can pop that up on YouTube after it's been edited. Um, and then just we just got to work on building the website out that is, you know, feasible and really easy to navigate and understand and get get the resources. Like uh, like Harvey said, he has the contacts. We just need to do the work of reaching out to these contacts and introducing ourselves and trying to forge a relationship with them that is beneficial to them. And then they'll see the ICA as something that is valuable. And then they will, in turn, you know, promote our mission and we can work together going forward. Of course. Uh, one, one small thing, I, maybe it's not a small thing. Uh, I uh, have a, a master's stu student from University of Michigan. Uh, she is an African-American woman. And I've kind of watched her uh, grow as a clarinetist for the past few years. 
And I think there, there's, there should be, um, you know, uh, manufacturers that have uh, young student artists. Um, my students that I've worked with through HEAL have asked me, are, who are the African-American women who are playing? Um, can you show me any videos? And you know, honestly, there's not very many, right? And so I think there's a, a need there too for uh, diversity and equality and just, um, you know, somehow uh, um, encouraging and motivating young players uh, when they see somebody who is black, if they're black, I just, I just feel like we aren't doing a very good job in that either. Some of that is manufacturer related. I, I, hope, I hope I'm not getting myself in trouble here, but I mean, I think, and we've had a few of us on this uh, committee have had that conversation before, but I just think, you know, the ICA maybe could start um, some sort of a student artist program with the eye towards, you know, could they come up with some videos that show how they practice and could those be disseminated to uh, public schools around the country? Just a thought. Maybe there are other better thoughts. I think uh, Cecilia has her hand up. Sure. Um, I just wanted to chime in regarding this idea of how can we make um, the resources more accessible. Um, I've noticed uh, some some you know uh, industry companies like Vendoran or Buffet. They have like campaigns, right? Like hashtag, or it could be. Um, uh, you know, maybe uh, in involving members of the ICA. I mean, we have a big, uh, um, big number of educators, obviously, uh, within the ICA that we can maybe each um, even start out reaching out to our state, you know, the music associations within. So like I live in Louisiana, so maybe I can do my part in um, sharing this information that, hey, on ICA, we have this database of all these like wonderful resources to the Louisiana Music Educator Association. That's like very easy for me to do as somebody who live in this, you know, in the state. And I'm, and I'm sure like many members within the ICA would be able to maybe reach out to their own, um, you know, uh, group of uh, 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 affiliated, um, whether it's associations or within their um, locale, um, but I think there's, so I brought up that question or that idea in chat and I know it's not new and it seems like every, um, there's so many um, opportunities now since COVID, especially with online courses pertaining specifically to um, clarinet and there are a lot of like workshops um, and, and I think just to find a way to centralize it. I mean, for me, I, I am biased, like I feel like if I anybody have, I mean, if I have questions about trumpet, maybe I would start going into the trumpet guild and, and try to look for information there. So maybe if we can um, make it sort of, um, you know, centralized location of these uh, resources, and then um, from there we can maybe notify our the local band directors or within the state, or reach out, collaborate with other organizations like College Music Society or MTNA or you know NAFME or. You know, it's just so that um, I feel like sometimes there's so much information, but it kind of gets lost. It's like if, if you're there to see that webinar, if you happen to know about it, you watch it and then um, it gets kind of lost. So um, just wanted to kind of share that idea. <clears throat> well, we do have a, a membership that can, can submit events. Anybody can submit an event on the website. Um, and I just add it to the calendar. And so like we've we've got stuff added on there and anybody can send it to me. And so that is one thing that we've done to sort of centralize um, opportunities and concerts and things that are going on. I know um, the Chamber Music Society, I think, sends out uh, a really amazing email every week that's just like, here are the events that are happening and how much they cost or if they're free. And I get that email every week and I sort of parse through it to see if there's something that we should add to the calendar. But I agree we should be communicating with these major organizations, not just in the U.S., but internationally. And I think um, 
I think that the the portal on the website and granted now the committee's just formed <laughs> this fall and so it, it took some time to get off the ground but now they really have nailed down what it is they want to work on and once they get me that information that website is really going to start to grow in value for people so the new music committee is working on a database that's got you know composers for clarinet and it's going to be very equitable but it's also going to have like grade levels and stuff and I think they're communicating with the pedagogy committee to determine what that grading system should look like um, and that's going to be linked out to publishers and things so people can have access to the music and how they can find it. Um, I know the pedagogy committee that we mentioned is working on videos. Um, we also had a couple things that outside of committee. We, we added a give a lesson, take a lesson program where people can volunteer to teach a private lesson over Zoom. And obviously, I think the, the future of that program is not Zoom. It's I am a state chair for, you know, for Louisiana and you can sign up and then I can communicate with people, constituents at universities in my state and get you connected with a teacher in your area. And I, I see that happening as, as COVID restrictions start being lifted and it feels safer. Um, we also have instruments being donated and, and Diana and Harvey, you can tell me, I have two B-flat clarinets, um, one that is wooden and one that is plastic, maybe two plastic clarinets and an E-flat plastic clarinet that have all been repatted and completely reworked if you guys need those and you have students in mind, please let me know. We can get them sent to you. I think that's a good way for us to start because we've already had these instruments donated and repaired. You know, that would be awesome. I, uh, you know, we have a young woman who was pretty small and we uh, actually, uh, the volunteer association with the symphony bought her a C clarinet um, and that was really helpful. Uh, we, we own it um, and she was using it. And an E-flat would be great to start another student um, uh, as well, or it could be used for, you know, a wind ensemble kind of um, event. But yes, if you have any, that would be terrific. I don't know, Harvey, what do you think? Yeah, you know, our, our saxophone players for sure are um, starting to double and I, I don't yeah. have any issues for them. Um, but if I may um, kind of piggyback on what was just said, um, I think you're, you guys are doing some amazing programming um, I'll give you this example, though. Um, in Missouri, there are, I don't think there are probably less than five students of color in the Allstate game. And I, I think it's less than five. Um, that, that's heartbreaking. Um, and I think, you know, just to stop there with, um, you know, state representatives, um, for the Music Education Association, it, it, it really doesn't go beyond that. Um, and forgive me, um, I wasn't aware of your work prior to Di Diana bringing it to me, you know? So what, what I'm saying is that I think there can be some things like having maybe regional, um, maybe a few regional people who can cover a, a few different parts of the country and then they develop subcommittees that eventually have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the schools themselves. Not, not giving, not leaving it up to one person to say, hey, here's it, here it is for your whole state. Okay, well, within that state, we may need a committee of five to 10 that can really spread out and go into the schools. So I think those things are extremely important because your work is not being shared with people who really need it. Um, so, you know, just having those re, um, relationships with those directors um, um, who can, who you can pinpoint, okay, this director is at this school, we know this person, um, this is what they need, and this is how they're using our resources. I think that's important. Um, just going down to the root, to the source is a way that will help. I think that's part of the reason that conversations like this are so important. And oftentimes for people who are, are white, it's really a painful conversation because it's a, a reflection of, of the lack of awareness <laughs> that we've had for such a long time. And so yeah. I appreciate you being honest with us. And I, I agree. We need to look deeper than what we, you know, we may be doing great things on the surface, but until we can get to the point where there isn't a need for a conversation of, you know, is this equitable? you just see the representation there. It's just a natural thing, what you mentioned before. Like when that happens, then we can sort of approach things maybe a little bit differently or maybe not. Maybe it just needs to be an effort uh, continuously. But 
I think that, that that's the best place for us to start. So I would love to get these instruments into the hands of kids since they're already ready to go and they're just sort of sitting at my house. So um, I will reach out to you both and get the email and then I'll get them sent to you. And then we can, maybe we can just do an article. I think a nice thing would be to do an article about these students if they're willing to be featured in the journal about um, what the work at the Heal Center means to them. And then, you know, I, I would just love to hear their stories and why they love the clarinet. That's, that's part of the reason that I love my job so much is getting to hear people who talk about what the clarinet means to them and in their lives. And I think we need to see more stories from people like the kids that you teach. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. And they would love to tell you that story. And, we, and remember, you can't do it all by yourself. So we, we're here to help support you. Um, we really believe in the work that you have. I believe that your work is already equitable. It just may not be as accessible as you would like for it to be. And that's what that's one of our missions is to help make quality arts programming accessible. So we'd love to help. Um, we'd love to connect with um, some of the, um, our partners that we have across the country, some of the directors that we have, who can be those regional directors for you and can really pinpoint you, your work to the need, to the, um, the regions and areas that really need your work and those directors as well. So I'm looking forward to, to working with you all and you know the great things that, that are gonna come from this. Apologies, I had a power cut and got thrown off uh, the internet. Um, <laughs> I, this has just been, I think, really inspiring today. Um, so just thank you so much. Um, from my perspective of being international and also being in the UK, um, one thing that is really important to me is to make sure that our work becomes international as well as national. Um, so I think an additional conversation that is vital for the International Clarinet Association is to talk about how can um, we make links internationally as well. Um, you know, can we um, have for example, a mentoring system between students abroad and here, um, or how can the ICA um, connect students from different countries together? Um, I think there's so many more conversations to be had on that. Yes, uh, Cecilia says pen pal, for example, um, or I think this is where where Zoom comes in long term. Um, can we make long term connections between different countries? That would be so valuable for you know the UK to to really connect with an organization like HEAL um, or for HEAL to connect with similar organizations in the UK. But then of course there's many other countries too. We'd love to be a part of them. Um, in fact, our, um, our summer camp had one student from the UK this summer, one of the instructors. One, I mean, one of the, um, uh, well, she was, she's, a, she's a teacher herself, but she joined our summer camp. Um, but yeah, we, we, we have, I have personally have family members and who are, um, you know, leaders like in Bermuda, um, the Bahamas and Jamaica. So I can help out with establishing relationships with some of the Caribbean islands. Um, so yes, I, 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 look, I look forward to that. I think that's great. Uh, I'd love to see an internship somehow. Um, and also, if uh, any of you can, can be thinking about a member of the ICA who's a great doubler who might uh, do a master class for the SAC students, uh, I'm actually starting one, possibly two uh, clar new clarinetists. Uh, I don't know, is Kyle a clarinetist or is he a sax clarinetist? He's a clarinetist. Okay. Doesn't, doesn't want to play saxophone. You know, I try. Oh man, I doesn't want to play saxophone. Broke my heart, but it's okay. <laughs> um, but you know, there you know might be some some opportunities there for students who are sax players if you're going to be starting them on clarinet. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I think looking at the time and, and knowing that we've taken far more of your time than, <laughs> than we initially said, which has been brilliant, um, this would probably be um, a good place to wrap things up um, and we'll make sure that um, this presentation also goes on the ICA YouTube channel and we'll really broadcast that around um, to make sure people see it um, and hopefully people will 
follow up from that as well and um, if people are watching on the youtube channel as well then i would like to invite even more people to be a part of the diversity committee as well and um, because the more people we have on the committee the more subcommittees we can form to do lots more work and to make better connections um so yeah please do contact uh, the ica if you want to be a part of that and in the meantime, thank you so much for coming today, uh, spending your Sundays with us, Harvey and Diana. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. It's really been encouraging for me. Sometimes I feel a little isolated, uh, you know, doing this work. So it's nice to hear about others uh, who are interested in our doing this work. And, and I think it's on you know everybody's minds that we need to do more work like this and post pandemic seems the perfect time to make things happen i think yes yes brilliant Great. Anybody, um, i think we shared our contact information already or you you guys have it so um feel yeah. free to reach out i'm looking forward to working with each of you yeah, let's not let this sit. We need to move forward with these ideas. These are great ideas and it's it's really fine to present them and talk about them, but unless they've put into action, then we've really failed. So we really need to go yeah. go full steam ahead. And I'm so glad to see all of you here. And I look forward to the future conversations about this and looking forward to seeing some real change come from this meeting. And thank you so much to Harvey and Diana for, for sharing thank you. your mission and your time and let's get going. Um, if, if anybody's interested, you can go to healcenterforthearts.org to see a little bit more. And if you care to make a donation, we will gratefully accept. Yes. Perfect. And I will add the chat conversation um, to the Google Drive for the Diversity Committee so that um, we have both your presentation and also um, the chat with all the ideas. Um, so actually, if we could have the presentation for the Diversity Committee, that would be really useful because it really highlights stuff there as well. Sure. Um, if you're happy. Then yeah, we could put these items that you've listed here on the action list. Um, that would be good. Yeah, this, this yeah. page here. Brilliant. Yes, definitely. It's a great page. We will send it right away. Thank you very much, Harvey.